This is called Understanding and Creating Supportive Environments for Those on the Autism Spectrum. Our whole conference today is uh, about key issues in communication. And for me, it was exciting just to hear that short report on, on what's happening in the, in the pilot research about dental practice, because the thing that people are beginning to understand, environments have a big, uh, a big chunk to play uh, when it comes to communicating what's happening in autism. Um, instead of just blaming us, they're beginning to look at other things, so it's exciting. Um, all right, come on, calm down. An insight, what to expect from this talk, an insight into some of the difficulties for those of us with an autism spectrum condition, why these are so, what you can do to help, um, and how we can help ourselves. I hope that you have the same slides as me. Do you have the same slides as me? Oh, good. That's a relief, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> some of the expectations on all of us. There's all sorts of situations where people are expecting that what I'm communicating is being received. Um, people look at each other when they talk. People stand a particular, uh, you know, closeness or further away. Um, they understand about a whole heap of things, like how you smell or don't smell. I was in the car yesterday going somewhere, and I said to the lady driving me, wow, it's fragrant in this car. And I opened the window and I gasped for air. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, she explained that um, uh, the car had recently been cleaned. And I say, sometimes one of the first things I do when I go somewhere is hunt the smelly. Uh, in a hotel, you're just minding your own business in the bathroom, doing what you have to do, and this thing puffs out you. Have you seen it? It just puffs at you. And it's often plugged in uh, or out of reach. You can't even take them away. And the, I think it's terribly unethical. They call these things fresh air. Have you, seen, have you heard of that? Yeah. In autism, these sorts of things are really, really important because of how our brain is wired up. It's, uh, everything seems to be a lot more intense for those of us on the spectrum. My mic's rubbing against things, isn't it? Making noises. If you have the kind of brain that multitasks, that can multifocus, that can um, attend to a number of differing things all at once, all of the stuff associated with personal communication, communication between people is an awful lot easier. Um, looking at people when they talk to you, not overlooking. I, I had a tendency to, to overlook, uh, etc. cetera. Um, all of that is a lot easier. I'll explain. Change. Change, change, and more change of context, place, and time. Why is it that life's transient stage plays such havoc with my mind? You said, we'll go to McDonald's. But this was just a thought. I was set for hours, but the plan then came to naught. My tears and confused frustration at plans that do not appear are painful beyond recognition and push me deeper into fear. How can life be so determined? How can change be so complete with continuity there is no end. Security and trust are sweet. So, who said change would not hurt me? Who said my being could not be safe? Change said, change said, you need continuity in order to find your place. For change makes all things different and no longer are the same. What was it that you really meant? All I feel is the pain. And I need to explain this. Did I just press that one and go down, or did it go up? OK. I need to explain this. For people who are not on the autistic spectrum, they say things about change. They say things like, change is as good as a rest, I think. Is that what they say? Um, variety is the spice of life. Do you really believe that stuff? <laughs> um, oh, we just need a change. Ugh. If you can kind of uh, think forward in your head and understand what that change might mean, then possibly you can relate to it quite well. Some of the changes that happen, I don't think you really like at all. Do you like, like, like um, uh, when they change uh, the bus route? 
or they take away the corner store. Yeah? Oh, 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 oh I know one. When they change the aisles in the supermarket and all you want, <laughs> or, yeah, you, all you want is a tin of soup or whatever and it's not where it should be. So you know what I mean, eh? Yeah, okay, thank you. So yes, there are times when change is welcome and you, you look forward to it. You get bored with the same old thing, is that right? But there are other times when change is not welcome at all, that you miss what it is you're used to. Now the reason I believe you can actually cope better than those of us with autism is because you can actually think further ahead and relate to what that change might mean and therefore you can actually anticipate if it's welcome or no. Whereas for us, as autistic people, that's something we don't do. We don't think beyond now. I'm in here, this is where I am, and this is what's taking up my thinking. So when somebody changes something, it's actually really hard to kind of anticipate what that might mean. And it's a, sometimes a really silly thing, like somebody said they'll be there at nine to come over to visit or to take you somewhere or something, and they turn up at five past. <laughs> So you can't let them in. I mean, you know, I mean, they've missed their appointment. Uh, uh, um, uh, you had all this vision uh, and understanding of what nine o'clock meant. You do not have that for five past. That's a separate thing. Whereas and the other person might say, and this is a strange one, I was running late. Have you heard of that? I run with my shoes on, but I mean, r I was running late. That's a strange one. Um, the buses weren't running on time. Oh, that <coughs> brings up all sorts of really strange thoughts. Um, uh, anyway, all sorts of things can happen, and I academically understand that, but its impact for me, oh dear, is all strange echoey noises. Can you hear it? Is it just me? All right, well, if I stand here, is it better? Oh, never mind. <laughs> Someone who is ASE, is going to be someone who is very single-minded, someone who's very good with things that interest them, not so much as a choice, but as their default setting. Someone who prefers structure, routine, and knowing what to expect, rather than surprises. Someone who might not like change. I met a little lad, he would have been about six, at a talk recently, uh, sitting in the front row, and he said during the break, um, hello, I'm Ben, um, it's my birthday. And I said, happy birthday. And he said, it's my birthday. And I said, happy birthday? <laughs> and he went on to say, if it's my birthday, why has mum invited John and Joe and da 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 da? Do you get this? It was his birthday. And, well, is it his birthday or is it theirs? Is it his birthday or somebody else's? was really hard, he did not have a concept for because it's your birthday mate, we can celebrate with others. He didn't have a concept for that at all. He just felt really cross. Uh, they kept telling him it was his birthday, they kept telling him happy birthday um, and so on, but he didn't see it from their perspective. He's very, very single-minded, very literal. So ASC might look like any of us, but the thing that you'll notice is that we're really focused. And that's where the passion comes in. Is that all right? Focused. The difference between <coughs> typical behaviour and behaviour in ASC is the way our brains are configured, however we got there, okay? If you're a typically developing person, you actually have a differently connected sensory, attention and interest system to those of us who are ASC. It's going to mean, if you're typically developing, you have a particular sensory motor loop that includes social interaction as part of your default setting. And what I mean by that is, when I talk about sensory, I mean anything connected to your senses. So smell, touch, taste, uh, hearing, knowing where you are in time and space and so on. Is that OK? Yeah. Uh, your senses are your first port of call for any information. You see something, process it. Your motor system is just your system of movement. It includes breathing, but any, any kind of movement that you are making, there's actually a sensory and a motor loop. 
One has to inform the other so that you can work together. You see something, you move towards it, that kind of thing. Is that okay? And if you're typically developing, your interest system that informs and works with your motor system is actually working differently on a different set, like a different operating system. Who knows about Mac, Hintosh? PCs, Windows, you understand the difference? A Mac works on a different operating system to a PC. We all agree? Yeah, they're, they're taught better to each other than they used to, but still all sorts of problems because their operating system is different. Um, I'm sure you know what I mean. I want us to have a few quiet moments and think way, way back, um, maybe to your very earliest memory, certainly to an early memory. And we're going to be very quiet while you do this. And then two or three of you are going to share what your memory has been, aren't you? <laughs> Thank you. Right, we'll be quiet while we think. Yes, anybody need more time? No? Uh, somebody over there might like to share what came to mind, please. One person. I was thinking that when I first had German measles. When you first had German measles, you were four. So everyone was going out, the family were going out, but you got left behind with your mum. Yes. And you didn't mind because you got given an ice cream. Yes. A lot of ice cream. Of ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So when you're remembering this, can you see, can you imagine yourself with the measles? Yes. Okay. Can you see the family going, leaving? No. Okay. So you were told they were going. It's a knowing not a feeling, yes? Um, how about the ice cream? I can picture it as clearly. You can picture it yeah. really clearly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's exciting. So the ice cream, which was the dominant thing here, that's what made you feel better, is the thing that has taken up most root in your memory. But even though it's a dominant thing, you're still in touch with the other aspects of that memory. Yes, super. Thank you. We're coming back to German measles. All right. Somebody in this section, please. Yep. I can't hear you. What do we do? Wait a minute, a microphone is coming. <laughs> Thank you. I know it, it, uh, people, it takes courage to do this. I appreciate it. Teamwork, pass the mic along. Look at this, great. Thank you. You were eating sand in playgroup when you were three um, by accident. You didn't choose to eat it, no. And, and you got, yeah, it, it does. It gets in the sandwiches when you go to the beach, it's horrible. So the sand in the mouth, can you remember how it felt? It's a lot of crunch and it's not comfortable no um, do you remember anything else like other kids saying anything or anything. anything else just the fact you're in the play pit sand pit and you've got this in your mouth and it's left an indelible kind of impact on your memory mm -hmm. and when you think about it and share it with us today what are you noticing That it's what? I didn't hear you, sorry. I uh, <laughs> I guess what I'm asking is, can you almost taste the sand as you share it? Yes. Oh, super. Thank you. Breathe. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I'm really hoping that somebody over this side, one more. Um, um, yeah, Daniel. Hang on a minute, Daniel. By hang on, I mean... Wait, <laughs> not this. The microphone is coming so they can hear you too. Yeah, it's quite a really clear one. It's watching a food sales cartoon in here, so where I'm finally disappeared. And for some reason, I remember this really quite strongly. I must have been about four or five, but that's just kind of mm -hmm. the first thing I'm trying to remember. I think that's kind of the first thing I could clearly remember. Okay, watching. Uh, 
um, Flintstones cartoon and Barney disappears. Is that what you said? Kind of, he turned invisible or something like that. He became invisible? Yeah. Okay. That would have been kind of uncomfortable. You would have wondered, where's he gone? All right. That's great, mate. Thank you very much. The reason we're talking about memory will become clear, she said. Um, I'm coming back to this. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, wish that time would make more sense. If it's then, what is now? And why do children enjoy pretense? My two granddaughters, AJ is six, Holly is three. Um, AJ has a pink plastic tea service, tea set. Uh, pink cups about this big. Can you imagine this? Plastic pink cups and pink plates about this size. Yeah? I'm over there and AJ comes up and says, Nana, I've made you your favourite. We've got uh, chocolate cake with chocolate butter icing in the middle and chocolate frosting on the top. Hence the size. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, and she passes me an empty plastic plate with nothing on it. Can you feel my disappointment? <laughs> I didn't know what to say to her. And I, I just stood there. And then she added, oh, oh, it's OK, and a cup of tea, white and one, just the way you like it. And she passed me an empty plastic cup. Um, I didn't know what to do, really. Uh, my daughter is standing in the wings, and she's mouthing toward me, substitution, substitution. We've ex she's explained this lots of times. Mum, if AJ plays a game with you, and it's a pretend game, and it's hard for you to kind of think about what it is she's talking about because it's pretend and it's not real, you have to substitute the nothing for something. So there's no cake, no tea, but you've got to act towards AJ as if it were there. <laughs> what kind of grandmother would I be <laughs> if I lied? If I, if I said to AJ, thank you, darling, that's lovely, when it's not how I feel at all, what kind of grandmother would I be? A typical grandmother, all right. Um, I need to find a way to make the play real. Now, I have a particular passion for Doctor Who. Uh, that you might not know what that is, and I'm not allowed to talk about it too long, but it's a TV series. <laughs> and in this TV series, there's a Time Lord and the Time Lord's able to fly through time in a police box, which is much bigger on the inside than it is on the out, in case you're worried about that. Anyway, so in my head, I'm thinking, cake, tea, got to get it here. Ah, the TARDIS. Uh, that's the uh, time machine. So I, in my head, place the tea and the cake inside the machine, and I envisage that they will be here soon. So in lieu of their arrival, I can say to AJ, thank you, darling, that's lovely. <laughs> and then live in hope. <laughs> right? if, if you don't have memories informed by a more rounded sensory system that's offering you a larger picture of a variety of understandings, your memories will be laid down as they are in autism, pretty much as kind of facts, or only feelings, or just the stuff associated with the environment. It's or, all, or nothing. Does that make sense? Our learning is so different in the world of autism. When we're thinking about communication and supportive environments, it's imperative that we understand how those of us with autism learn. If we don't, we're not going to understand how to supply and encourage the right kind of connections. Um, let me just show you. Um, OK. I'm not going to talk about that at the moment. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to go to this one. I'll go back to the other. You see, illustrated on this slide, three different nerve types. Um, there's one. Whoa, on your left, which is to do with 
the motor system of movement. Can you see it's got kind of tree-like branches? You see those at the top? And those will um, reach out and connect to others. And signals will travel along through that system of connection. Quite a few signals simultaneously. And then if you go to the other side on the right, you have also a, a multipolar nerve, but it's to do with the sensory system. So the foliage of this tree, lots of tentacles, lots of branches that will reach out because it's multitasking. This enables a whole heap of information from your various senses to come together and travel and build connections. And these two interact. Now the nerve in the middle is kind of illustrating a unipolar or single sensory, part of a single sensory nervous system. Uh, how, much, how many tree-like branches does it have on the top? Just a couple of little ones. Doesn't have many, does it? Tentacles? No, it doesn't have many because it's not a multitask, multipolar part of that system. It's part of a single sensory system. Now, what's happening in autism, and this is from the research from um, Mary Jane Miller, uh, what's happening in this in autism is that we're condensing um, kind of three, three highways of information into one. Um, what happens when you get three roads going into one, by the way? <laughs> yeah, you get preserves, uh, traffic jam, yeah? You get congestion, everything slows down, sometimes it becomes like a solid state of non-movement, is that right? Yeah, so you imagine all the information, things that we're supposedly learning from memory, things that we're um, taking on board each day, being condensed from lots of situations into one. That's going to be overwhelming. And that's happening in autism all the time. That's happening in autism all the time. Kids, teenagers and adults are easily becoming overwhelmed by a whole load of information. <coughs> now, if I... Where do I go? To this one. Sorry to skip about. I'm not really skipping, but you know the, the term. <laughs> yep. Um, this is also from Mary Jane. Can you see the slide at the top? They had a young lad playing in a pit of coloured balls, the, the blue, red and, blue, red and yellow, like you find at Ikea. Yeah, you know the ones I mean? And his dad was kind of swinging on a holster thing coming down and tickling him. And this little boy was thoroughly enjoying the game. He was laughing, he was giggling. If you looked at him on the outside, he seemed to be connected to a lot of different things. He was laughing, his body was moving, um, he was obviously feeling. So many things were happening simultaneously. But when we looked at the graph, particular waves from his brain, a single line, very little undulation. Can you see that? Yeah, the other scan over here with the peaks and the troughs was his father. A lot more activity going on. You imagine all of that information from the game coming in through one system. So eventually what happens to this little boy is he starts to throw the balls at his dad. He screams. He's having what some people call, which is a very strange expression, a meltdown. <laughs> he's not melting and he's not going down. <laughs> but it means his system is closing down and he's not coping, so he screams. There's no warning. There's no, oh, Dad, I'm not coping. I need to stop soon. This is too much. None of that. It goes from excited and laughing to screaming and throwing in a moment. Yeah? That's because all of these highways of information that are in the typical brain and exist as structures in my brain are actually moving into one because of my autism. This was what was happening for him. Do you get this? Can you imagine what would happen in an ordinary classroom? What about an ordinary family room? How many of our teenagers go to their bedrooms and shut the door? Hey, it's happening all the time. Where are they happiest? Playing at their computers, for example? Yeah. What does the computer not, not send out that people do? How long have you got? body language, facial expressions, verbal demands, 
it's at you, at you, at you, at you all the time. And if you've got through a whole day at school, you've got through a whole day at work, you've got through a whole day at college, you've got through a whole day. <laughs> wow. By the time you get to that end of the day, it's just overwhelming. But the first thing for me that happens is my speech goes. I, I lose all ability to talk. So I can't even tell you. So I just shut the door. I just close you out. That's all I can do. That's the best attempt. I can't even explain why this is happening. I can now because this is part of what I'm doing. But it's very difficult. Remember we looked at this at these slides this morning? Do you remember those? I remember seeing them in the video? And I said that was, that was a part of the language centre in Temple's brain. And we talked about how sometimes during language, during um, thinking, during understanding, sharing, whatever, bits of information come and other bits get lost. Because in the typical brain, everything is moving nicely together. But in autism, it tends to be a bit fragmented. In autism, our brains are wired up so differently. You can't see this on the outside, but you'll see it very much so in behaviour. And this is important if we're going to do supportive environments, because if we just look at behaviour, we're going to come undone. Don't we do this? We look at someone's behaviour and we think, oh, yes, he's jealous. Yeah? Or, oh, she's angry. Well, that might be so in the typical person. But if you've got somebody laughing, giggling, flapping, what might they be if they're autistic? They might be stressed. They might be anxious. It can look like happy, but that might not be what it is. So it's really important that we get to know the individual that we're living with, supporting, loving, relating to, so that we get to understand what is their way what is, what, is, what is their behaviour communicating? It mightn't be what looks like on the outside. It's really important to understand. Um, uh, I'm not going to go on about that one. This was an interesting... Um, this is work coming out of Louisville. Uh, involved, I'm involved with a, a guy called Manny Casanova and his team, Professor Casanova. Uh, I, know, I know he's a lovely bloke, lovely bloke. It's only on his third marriage, I think. <laughs> no, 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 it's probably second. Lovely, lovely bloke. Anyway, most of the team, uh, a lot of the team, are on the autistic spectrum themselves, which um, is exciting for me. I'm working with people that, you know, we understand one another. If Andy needs his office blinds all closed and he works in the dark and he can't look at you when you talk to him, no one thinks twice about it. That's Andy. No one looks at his behaviour and thinks he's rude, He's difficult, he's the opposite. It's just he needs that for the sensory world that is overwhelming him if we put lights on and make him look at us. As a kid growing up, they used to do this sort of thing to me. I used to have to look at the world through the gaps in my fingers. Um, when the world's coming at you all at once, if you do this, oh, you get relief because you, you frame the world you're looking at. So you only have to look at a little bit. <laughs> oh, it's lovely. And then along comes some uninformed teacher. <laughs> I didn't call her an ignoramus, see? <laughs> and says, hands down, because it's not normal, because it looks odd, because you'll be setting yourself up to be bullied. No, none of those are legitimate at all. They might be for typical thinking, but that's not what's going on for me. When you take away my mechanisms to cope, my aggressive type behaviours, um, strange behaviours, uh, um, inappropriate behaviours will all increase. If you don't give me the means to be able to cope, then it's not my fault these behaviours are here, it's as a result of these other things. If, if, if we have somebody um, in a wheelchair, perhaps they're paralysed from the, from the waist down or, or something, do we say, look, the majority, the majority of us walk, so get over it? Do we? Please say no. <laughs> no, we accept this person, for their life to be accessible, they need that chair. What about someone who's deaf, who has to have hearing aids? If you're not deaf, do you need hearing aids? So why should they be allowed? Don't you think it's discrimination? <coughs> some of the arguments that people, some of the things people say to me, 
This child has to wear a school uniform. We know it drives him nuts and causes him to be overwhelmed with sensory down, you know, overload that he, he, he has to sit there uh, with a blanket over his head. But he's got to learn to cope with it, they say. They say, no, he needs a tracky, a tracksuit. Tracky Dax, that's Australian. He needs a tracksuit. He can't cope with those buttons. He can't, oh, but the other kids, the other kids don't have that issue. We need to teach the other kids so that they understand that this is a real problem for him. Does that make sense? We've got to change our thinking. Otherwise, it's like saying the girl who wears the short skirt, that's the reason she got raped. Have you heard of this? She got raped because of blah, blah, blah. That's ridiculous. Why do we excuse the other side? I'm not sure. It's not, I'll have to do some research on it. Um. Oh, yes, this is what I was going to talk about. See, I get sidetracked. <laughs> sidetracked. Uh, Manny's is, is, one, is he's the guy who, dis, who discovered um, mini columns in the brain, which are like little springy uh, columnar cells. They're very, very small. Um, the microphone's gone, thank you. It's not gone anywhere, but I know what you mean. <laughs> <sighs> Some people wouldn't, but I do. The square with the round kind of, no, no. The blue square with that red outline. Can you see that one? Yep, that's on your left. Um, can you see the, the white spaces between those cells? Yeah, well that's a kind of typical brain. The one underneath is what we see in autism. A lot more crowding, a lot more of these mini columns. And it's interesting because in siblings, of autistic young people. We notice that their mini columns aren't as spaced apart as typical kids, but they're not as crowded close together as in the world of autism. They're kind of in the middle. Now, isn't that interesting? I, I, I find that really interesting. So there's things going on for siblings of autistic kids as well. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out, because this goes in, in line with that sensory overloading. It goes in line with too much going on in our heads. It goes in line with things getting lost because of the crowd and so on. So it's an important bit of information. And it's connected to this image too. Um, just that this is at a, uh, a larger level. This is to do with brain mapping, whereas the mini columns are under huge microscopes. You need to magnify things quite large to see those. The autism way. I hear the words. Sorry, is it that time already? Yes, obviously. I hear the words that come each day. What do they mean? I hear me say. Words, words and more words, all in a line, one at a time. You come and stay. Words go away. You look at me in wonder. I drift away. I hear you say, but then I take my time. You are here and gone away. Perhaps I'll get it another way, but not this way and not today. It is so common that in autism, because of how information is presented to us, people expect that we'll be able to have a conversation and join in and respond in the same, same time frame as if we were a typically developing individual. Now, I can stand up here and present to you no problem. I love this. Don't get anxious. I've no idea what embarrassed feels like. But this is a very different situation to Wendy at a dinner table, or uh, Wendy in the crowd, uh, Wendy um, part of a group that they're expecting things from me. You've got to process all that information very quickly, you've got to respond very quickly. And those sorts of environments we grow up in, school is exactly like that, families are like that. Uh, the expectation upon a, a kid growing up with autism who will become a teenager and an adult with autism is huge because people see from the outside we're not looking any different to anybody else a lot of the time. Does that make sense? So the expectation, especially if you're higher functioning, is pretty big. If you have an intellectual disability, in some ways you're off the hook a bit because people don't expect so much of you. You've got to be careful here though, because what can look like intellectual disability in autism is not so. Yeah? Just because a person isn't talking doesn't mean they don't think. Just because a person isn't talking doesn't mean they haven't got lots to say. It just means that speech mightn't be 
the avenue that they need to use to communicate through. Okay, this is something else we're finding in the research, the, in our research. The two slides on the left are what we're finding in autism. Um, the one at the bottom is taken from my brain. The other one is from an, another young person in the study. Um, can you see the red, the red, the red blotches? Yes? Well, those represent gamma. Now, gamma in the brain, that kind of gamma, is actually a particular wavelength um, that takes information from other, other waves of information in your brain, like gamma, uh, alpha and beta. You understand those ones? You've heard of those? Alpha waves, beta waves, theta when you're sleeping. Um, gamma is responsible uh, primarily for, for putting the information together and then presenting it back to you as a big picture. So it's a very important wavelength, if you like. It hooks the information in from others, and anchors it and makes it available. Now, all this gamma in Wendy's brain, does it look like it's doing anything? I'm sure it's doing lots, but it's scattered, and there's too much of it. We want to find a way that we can make it work, a bit like in the other slides, where it's doing its job so well, and the top slide over there, you can't even see it anymore. And then the one underneath, it's just that red kind of anchored blotch. Yeah? We want to find a way in autism that can help people um, build an understanding, build concepts. Uh, I'm going to move on from that. And here, you can see Wendy in the chair with Tato, who's a scientist, um, holding a very large magnet over my head. You see that? Flick, flick the sides of your head gently. Don't hurt yourself. It's not particularly comfortable, but it's not too bad, is it? Mm. That's what the, every time the, there's a pulse from the magnet, that's what it feels like going into my head. Now we've set the, the magnet strength on about half the strength they're using in Europe. Um, and this magnetic kind of treatment is called RTMS, repetitive, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. Does that make sense? It's repetitive because it's going on and on and on um, for about 10 minutes twice a day for a fortnight. I had this treatment. Uh, now it was quite exciting. What it did was encourage uh, the attention window that I'm looking through to kind of extend. So rather than being able to attend to something for, say, six seconds, it increased it to 10. Does that make sense? So yeah, this is doing good stuff. And it's only $10,000 ago. <laughs> so does that make it accessible? No. no. OK. It was interesting to see that we can change what's going on in the brain. Your brain is changing all the time just by being here today, listening to what you're listening to. Going through your experiences is changing your brain. But don't be alarmed. It's OK. I don't want to scare people. Anyway, these changes are important because it's showing us that the brain is malleable. We talk about plasticity with the brain, and it's very exciting. But it's, it's, it's not available. It's too expensive. The other thing we noticed, almost as a sideline, can you see Wendy watching the DVD underneath? Yep, that was um, from Planet Earth, David Attenborough. Yeah. Well, I was so excited when... You, you, who saw Happy Feet? Yeah, when, when the penguin is there and there's this egg between its legs and it's beginning to crack. Oh, that's exciting. So in real life, as in watching the movie with like, cartoon characters, I was very excited to see these penguins coming out and then the polar bear with the cubs on the ice. All that, I was very excited. What we noticed was that attention, the facility for in Wendy's brain also increased as a connection um, from interest. Interest actually helps synchronize gamma. Oh, I hope I'm putting this plainly enough. Do you know what I mean? If you're interested, you are more focused. Is that a fact? We know this. But if you've got a typically developing brain, you can have lots of different things you're interested in. You move between interests. You can share interests of other people that you're not interested in which is very interesting if you think about it. <laughs> but in autism, 
that shifting of attention is not so available to us. It's one of the reasons Daniel's gone, but his memory, did you hear his memory? He was watching a cartoon, a Flintstones cartoon, and Barney became invisible. That's it. It doesn't add anything. It's the facts of what happened, yeah? And in autism, our, our memories are being laid down in kind of really clear-cut scenarios, but they're not laced with the wider understanding. So when people come to teach us, um, they use the wider understanding. They, 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 they start reasoning with us. Have you come across this? When you were learning, whatever you were learning, people used reasoning to explain things to you? Because, what do four-year-olds, their most common question is, why? Why? Because. Why? Because. How reasonable are we as autistic people? Be careful, Wendy, I'll get myself into trouble. <laughs> if it's log logical, and I can see the equation, probably not a problem. But that's not how people reason with us, and it isn't how people teach. So if we're going to create environments that are conducive to support and to learning, we need to consider the sensory environment, we need to consider how people learn, we need to consider the human factor, and so on. We need to put all this together in a package that is really supportive. If we don't understand autism, we're going to try and support through our kind of typical knowledge, and that it doesn't work the same way. I learn best when I'm interested because that's when my brain is online. Take away interest, it's like turning me off. Does that make sense? It's like I'm offline, I can't connect. There's nothing for me to relate to. So it's so important we don't take away interests. Instead, we need to use them. Uh, here's a picture um, of a computer in the middle. There's also a picture of a garden with lots of different colored flowers. Probably most of us find the garden more interesting when it's more colourful. If, it was all, if all the flowers were white, that's very nice. But we mightn't notice as much, do you think? It's a bit like that. It's a bit like, for us, the garden's all white. And for you, it's all these different colours. It's all these different aspects. And we want to find a way to support me in building a wider understanding of this garden. Now, the, the good news about technology is it can do this in brilliant ways. D did you notice the little bit of film I showed you this morning, if you were here? The kids using iPads, the kids who don't speak, um, were connecting in ways that were beyond belief at times, in ways that people had no idea they could. And that's because of the supportive medium that was being used to communicate. Speak or speech is cheap. Anybody can do it, really. I get myself into trouble again. Communication, now that's an art, yeah? And sometimes parents will say to me, well, when will he or she talk? I don't know. But what I do know is that he or she would like to communicate now. And he or she can communicate even without speech via other means, via role play, story, um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, is that right? And all of those things can be done on a computer. For years, different modes of technology have been used to improve the quality of life of people who have various developmental disabilities. However, the varied use of technology for autism spectrum individuals continues to receive limited attention, despite the fact that technology tends to be, tends to be, a high interest area for many AS individuals. Not for everybody, but for those of us who are connected or interested in the we. People use the we? All right, hands up if you don't use email. You all use email. Yep. Did I do it? Oh, one hand. OK, you're allowed not to. Don't understand it, but it's okay. It's okay. The point is, I ask, I ask this for a reason, and that's because we typically use email and texting and mobile phones as part of our everyday life these days. If we'd asked this question even five years ago, 
a good third of you would have put your hand up. Ten years ago, it would have been more than half of you who didn't use email. So the times are changing. Sometimes people say to me things like, it's a shame that pens are going out of fashion and writing, and that people are using keyboards. And I say, don't you think that's a little bit, you know, what's the word? Um, not nostalgic. Um, oh, I can't think of the word. Antiquated. Oh, thank you. A little bit antiquated. I like that. Yeah. I want to say, get with the times. Um, I'd rather that a kid was keeping up with his peers or her peers via a keyboard than missing out because they were being made to, to, to use a pen, practice their handwriting. Supportive environments might include keyboards and laptops and iPads, etc. iPod Touch is, is a, an exciting innovation and using something like, anybody using Proloquo to go? Proloquo? Proloquo to go? Nobody? That's interesting. I hope the next time I ask that question, should you be in the room, more of you will put your hands up. Especially for kids who don't use speech. It's a, uh, an environment that offers symbols, photos, videos, music, uh, so many things. I went into my local McDonald's at home in Australia and ordered a meal, gluten-free, because I'm a celiac, uh, via the software on Proloquo to go, and the person, 23-year-olds, selling the burgers and whatever, didn't have a clue what I was asking, even though it was a speech program that I typed in through symbols that gets converted to speech. He could understand the talking, but he was so not used to anybody communicating in any other way, he didn't know what to do. So more of us should be doing this, so we train the people out there in the shops and libraries and buses and trains to accept different types of communication. The sensory environment helps or hinders social interaction. If an ASC individual has sensory issues, I've got hypo, and when I, when I see that word, I always think of a hippo. Um, <laughs> when you go to Melbourne Zoo, or at least every time I go, the hippos are mostly submerged. There's just their heads above. Have you ever seen them? No, we might not have been to Melbourne Zoo. Um, so I think hippo because when I think of, of people with a hypo sensory connection, it's like there's so much going on underneath that we're not seeing. They're not connected to. They're desperately looking for connection. So these are the, these are the young people that will, not by accident, put sand in their mouth, but bits of, bits of glass and grit and twigs and all sorts of things go in the mouth, desperately seeking connection. These are the kids who put their fingers up the bums, bless them, uh, smear feces, dig holes in the garden. They're looking desperately for communication. Things that would turn you off, turn them on, in other words. So finding legitimate ways to connect them is really important. And then you've got the hyperactive kids. These are the kids that have fingers in their ears, hands over their ears. These are the kids that are rocking. These are the kids that hum louder than you to shut you up because their system is already overwhelmed. So, and some kids will move between the two in the same hour. So it's not, oh, they're hypo or they're hyper. We're often a connection. Uh, no, not connection. Con, what's the word? Combination. Thanks, thanks for hanging in with me here. Um, yeah, but they're not available to listen if their sensory system is closing down or is looking to be overwhelmed. They're on the go. They're, they're moving about, trying desperately to find a connection. They're not available to you. Addressing sensory needs are essential. Ignoring them or hoping they will disappear with time, not an option. Every AS individual deserves a sensory environment that does not cause them pain or discomfort. So please accept my difference. I hope uh, in this very short time that I've painted a bit of a picture for you. The tools that I use to communicate, and I need you to join me in these, are interest, appropriate mediums that facilitate interest, accessible language in a form that captures my interest, and my strengths motivated by interest. Uh, on my home page, there's a story of a young lad who kept being excluded from school 
and having a terrible time with him, lots of uh, inappropriate behavior and so on. But his love and his passion were bees. So for his special intervention plan at school, his mum wrote stories about how we could integrate into the timetable stories based around bees and honey and hives and gathering and all that kind of thing. Anything that emanated from the life of bees. Does that make sense? This little lad couldn't wait to get to school. His whole school experience changed. And he was encouraging other little kids, not little, some of them were quite big, in his class to join in his, his experience. You, you read the story. This is someone's real experience. And it's on Wendy's homepage. So all you've got to do is type wendylawson.com into Google, and uh, you'll find the homepage. Secondly, we need help to access the world we all live in. I don't need to be kept restrained in mine. I do need people to use accessible language. IT, I believe, is one of those things that makes understanding accessible. I've got some other things on there that you can read. Um, building awareness depends upon facilitation, interest, and motivation. My tools to access awareness are not going to be the same as yours. Words, body language, intuitive connections, these are your tools, they're not mine. I don't work with those. So we've got to find a different way to build and integrate an understanding. Um, how to integrate information in a highly changeable environment. How to build up connections. If you're little, a typically developing four-year-old, you are noting, then modeling other people. That's how you learn. But in autism, I don't do that. I don't notice and then model others. That's not how I learn at all. I want to learn. How do I understand things like successful turn-taking? Being told it's not your turn. This is something I actually did. Uh, I pushed, I, no, I watched. I watched the people and they had to get to this line. When they were at that line, it was their turn to go next. Does that make sense? And I was told, no, no, you have to wait till you're next. So I pushed all the other kids out of the way, and then I was next. And then I, I couldn't understand why I was in trouble. Uh, so it's, it's the way things were explained to me. They weren't being explained in a way that made sense to me. I'm, I'm going to move on from this because it's too much. Um, sorry, I've taken too long to tell you these things. And anyway, you can read these things, so that's OK, I think. So show, um, if you just tell me, I, I'm, I learned to say, I learned to say yes because it got me into less trouble than no. Uh, it didn't mean I understood it. Um, if I can show you, it's more likely that I've understood you than just being able to tell. Is that all right? Uh, so these things are <laughs> highlighting strengths is very very important. All of these things you've got in front of you. Um, email that's non-text based is very, very available these days. So just because someone doesn't talk or doesn't write doesn't mean they can't use email. Um, you can use a non-text non based package, which um, in includes pictures, which is so much easier to work with than words. Uh, the actual basic pat package looks like this. But you can put your own pictures, your own video, your own music in. Then you've got a way for someone to share with you. People, when I was much younger, they, the, the social workers would meet together and make these arrangements about my life. Did they ask me? No, this was supposed to be support. Support for Wendy. Where will she live? What will she wear? Where will she work? What will she do? They didn't talk to me about it because they said, oh, no, if you're autistic, that's overwhelming and it's too hard for you to actually... <laughs> that's not true. It's just you've got to find the right way for me to be able to share with you. And that might be something like email. I can email people and tell them what I'm thinking and feeling, what's happening for me. Whether I can uh, read or not is, is not the point. A common interest, shared fun can happen around the computer. I've had people say things like, computers are isolating, computers are separating, um, computers are stopping people from being social, and all of that might be true. 
but actually in the world of autism, they might actually be helping me become social. They might be helping me build connection. Technology is a big, big chunk of supportive, uh, the supportive world. Um, even through watching telly, I learned so much through watching TV. I, I didn't learn always good things, I have to say. Some uh, things that you're not supposed to learn, perhaps. But I learned that you do this, that person does that. Turn-taking, listening, observing, sharing, valuing, appreciation of self and others. All of these sorts of things can be learned through the medium of technology. If we feel confident and valued, we are less likely to need to be stubborn, difficult and unfriendly. So treat us the way you would like others to treat you, remembering we have interests too, but that we can't just let those go to share yours. All right, got to stop. Thank you.